think I've always been an artist, but I didn't know the word artist. Um, as a kid, I processed the world visually and through my body. I didn't speak until I was two years old. And the first time I spoke was a full sentence asking to understand about a material object in the world. I think I use materials because I'm drawn to them as a physical learner. That again, I navigate the world with my hands, my body, my eyes. There's an intelligence, I think, of the hands and of the body um, not to separate it from our mind, of course they're connected, but I think some people lead out with a cerebral process and I lead out with more of a physical process. Recently, my paintings and works on paper have um, involved a central form. And these central forms come from like a peripheral place, like in um, like my peripheral vision. Often they're sourced in a liminal space, like forms and patterns I see between sleep and consciousness or in a meditative state. And I'm interested in a, a form that is immediate and direct, has a sense of power and urgency and physicality. And so these forms, I think, in a way, are characters that I'm putting into my paintings and, again, are in dialogue with um, objects and images that often are associated more with devotional things or, you know, icons or talismans or magical objects, that, that these kind of things that have a presence and a power to them, I'm trying to channel, essentially, this kind of liminal space and these forms into an object and pour time into it to give it kind of a, a character. From a young age, I was really um, hypersensitive to sound and um, image. I also felt visually overwhelmed. I couldn't filter visual information that well. The worst thing was going into a store like um, Kmart. I'd have to focus on a spot on my mom's back and walk through the store because I couldn't, I'd see everything at the same time and it would overwhelm my, my kind of, my sensory cortex. I found that if I went out into nature, I was able to process the information better because there was a lot of information, but it didn't overwhelm me in the same way. Or I'd spend hours just watching ants on the ground. When I was probably five or six living in Texas, I would go with my younger sister into these clay hills um, near our house, and I would dig up clay bodies and form them into pastel shapes and dry them in the sun and go and test them to see which would make better drawings. So again, from a young age, I was drawing, I was in nature, I was processing things through my eyes and my hands. And this is kind of what an artist is, I think, but um, I didn't know that till later. I grew up in a large family. Um, I was the second of eight. I was a military brat. And so growing up, we moved constantly, sometimes three or four times a year. And so I kind of got this sense of always being outside um, or being in between places. I remember we lived in Georgia and, and I'd go to school and sing gospel songs and I loved it. And I was taught to say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, to be respectful. And then we moved from Georgia to Massachusetts and I'd say, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. The teacher sent me home with a note saying, um, we need you to stop being disrespectful um, by saying yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. So it was, it was oh, of course, I wasn't trying to be disrespectful. It's just there's such different cultures, even in, in um, America. And I was always moving between these things. And so I felt like I was outside looking in, which I think is a nice place to be as an artist, um, kind of being in between things. I also was growing up in the 70s and the 80s. So I'm a child of punk music and new wave music. And I think punk and new wave 
were about um, breaking down something and rebuilding it. Again, being in between, really in between this kind of dying industrial society that was shifting to a post-industrial service culture. We also had in the art world, I didn't know it at the time, but it was kind of the end of modernism and the beginning of these kind of post-modern attempts to reconstruct or deconstruct the meta narratives we had. And so I think it felt comfortable for me to be in this place between things, both because I was moving a lot, because culturally I was part of Generation X, where we thought maybe you could just break the world and reform it. And there was kind of a uh, nihilism, but also an optimism that you could recreate the world. I had a photographer visit my studio, a photographer who makes really large scale, beautiful photographs. He was looking at a painting that was in process and that I had been struggling with. And he asked me, he said, well, how long have you been working on this painting? And I said, well, it's somewhere between 100 and 200 hours. And he looked at me and he said, are you serious? He stopped and said, I, I don't think I've actually worked on a photograph for more than 10 hours in my life. You really have worked on that for 100 hours? And uh, at first, I mean, I was making paintings and they were maybe taking a couple hundred hours to finish. And it felt like I wanted to slow it down even more. And I did that. Uh, I make all of my own paints and my grounds and my supports. And so there's a lot of time that goes into the work before I ever start. And I like that my hand was involved in the process from the beginning to the end. But I also like that it slowed things down and it felt like it embedded time in it for me. Um, and I think at first it was intuitive, but I started thinking about, well, why am I trying to make this thing that's already slow be slower? So there's a, a kind of absurdity about this method of making an image because we live in a world where you can make images in so many more efficient ways than painting, but I like the inefficiency and it felt like I wanted to double down almost and just make it even more inefficient and, and make it um, less sensible to people. This is actually a way of making oil that comes back from alchemical times from the 1400s. They called it two fire oil. Of course, you wouldn't have done it on a heating element. So you'd heat it on a fire and then it would catch fire when it hit its flash point. They'd cover it to extinguish it and then heat it again till it caught fire a second time. So it's a ancient kind of way of modifying oil back to times of alchemy. Um, and it is using lead. It's turning it into gold of a sorts. And again, it's like understanding something that has a connection to the past. There's also practical things it does. It changes the characteristics of the oil. And so it changes the characteristics optically and technically of my paint. But there's more than that. It's like slowing it down and understanding it. And maybe there's something about um, magically transforming something from one state to another, which was the alchemical dream, right? That it's exciting to me too. The main thing I want to avoid is the flash point, you know, so that while it's called two fire oil, I just as well have zero fires, right? So I take it to 680 degrees Fahrenheit. So really hot. So, um, so I take it off when it's had this chemical transformation. So it'll, um, it kind of bubbles up like this, then the bubbles kind of drop down in it and it starts churning and it darkens like a dark material. Then it clears up like a coffee where you can see into it a teeny bit. And that's visually, I'd know when to take it off even without the thermometer. The thermometer is mostly just so I make sure that I don't catch it on fire. Art has never been logical to me or practical to me. It's a endeavor of, of love or passion and that defies the kind of market economy that we live in. The culture that we live in and the economy that we live in is based on um, scarcity of resources. We take those resources out of circulation and we deplete them. Um, I'm interested in a different kind of um, a narrative, a different kind of economy where scarcity is replaced by abundance, depletion by excess, and taking things out of circulation for generosity. And I remember when um, I lived in New York, there was an ancient wooden sculpture of a bodhisattva, I think it was Maitreya, that was donated to a major museum in New York and they were doing conservation work on it and they x-rayed it and they found inside of its stomach a hidden compartment with a thousand baby bodhisattvas carved in a prayer scroll. 
I guess if you spend hundreds of hours on something, it feels like either you're crazy or you're devoted. And I was interested in being in that place of maybe craziness or devotion. I think that uh, making art is an act of generosity and I want things to slow down and be material partially because I wanna pour more energy into my work. And I feel that as I pour more of myself into it, perhaps it can come back out the other side. I think it's just it's something that I understand from the ground to the finish. Like, you know, you think about it, your car, like I have no idea how my car works. I have no idea how the economy works. I have no idea how most things work, but I know how paint works. So I can take a material like oil and eggs and I know how to gather um, calcium carbonate and titanium. So it's like something, one of the few things in life that I actually understand. I like to work hard. So being involved in this from the ground up, I understand it, it puts time into it, and I have to work darn hard. So maybe it makes me feel happy. <laughs> My wife is this way too with, um, she makes her own dyes or she makes clothing. And so this kind of idea of we grow something, we make something out of it. And there's like an, uh, a knowledge of what we're doing and maybe an integrity behind it. Like if you grow your own tomato, it tastes so much better. If you make your own thing, there's like, um, there's a care and a humanness in it that we just don't have much of these days. Because again, it's not about efficiency, it's about love more where, you know, because it doesn't make sense. But I like things that don't make sense. Maybe, maybe in the end they make the most sense. Yeah. You know, maybe the things that don't make sense um, they don't seem to make sense in our market economy, but maybe they're the things that actually nourish us as humans. So I think maybe I'm trying to be nourished. I started controlling my breathing when I paint as a way of controlling my arm at first, I think, where I was trying to do um, a long straight line and I found I had more control if I had my arm extended and if I exhaled when I was painting. I heard a poet talk once about how every time a person speaks a poem, you're exhaling and in a way you're stepping towards death. Like you're giving a bit of your life up to say these words. And I really love that. And I thought that, you know, if I, if I only paint on an exhale, it's like I'm pouring a bit more energy into my work. And again, I want more time, I want more energy, more generosity, more love, more commitment in these works. And breathing was a way for me to be present and to put more into the painting and also led to, it's like a repetitive process, a repetitive meditative process that led to um, a trance-like state where thought ceased. So this breathing is in a way a linear process breath, but when I repeat it, it's like time stops and I enter into this trance that's like a circle more. And this, this has become an important part of my art sense, this getting into a place where I'm using something that appears like a line, but is actually a circle. It appears like it's going in one direction, but it loops back on itself, or perhaps it establishes a set of rules to contradict those rules and undermine them. And the first time I experienced a linear process that became a loop was as a young boy playing Donkey Kong in arcades in middle America. It's a simple game that says, how high can you get, indicating a linear process, and you're climbing up these girders trying to rescue this princess from this gorilla. But what happens is every time you get near her, she's taken away and you start over. So this thing that appears like a linear quest for this princess starts to become a circle where it loops. And because of a glitch in the game, there's what is called a kill screen. First level, there are two screens. In the second level, there are three. In the third level, there are four. And then it just keeps repeating until this 117th screen where you just simply die for no reason. And it was, uh, again, it's a particular type of game that's risk-based, doesn't require a lot of thought. It's like physical reaction. And I found that while seeking kind of individual um, entertainment in an arcade, I entered this kind of looping place where thought ceased. And it was maybe um, a Western low culture backdoor into Eastern philosophy. Um, and so ironically, while seeking individual entertainment, I got to a place where the individual ceased. 
and, um, and then the hero died. So I experienced essentially the death of the hero. Lately, um, I'll, I'll create a central form or an image in a painting, and then I like to block it, or I'll put um, a net on top of it or a grid on top of it. I think it's about seeing something through something else where I um, don't have a clear vision of what I'm seeing. So for example, in a Catholic cathedral, seeing um, an object through a choir screen, this kind of screen or lattice or um, net in front of an image, I like how often it vibrates and it messes with the optic nerve so that it has a, a kind of a literal physical presence where it pushes back against the viewer. Um, this kind of interruption feels kindred to where I'm um, mining and mapping these forms. Like the lattice or the screen on top of another image, I'm, I'm interested in um, low relief carvings, like early American tombstones where there's like a skull carved um, in relief, shallow on a tombstone, or um, Assyrian low relief carvings. I love how there's um, a figure and then the cuneiform goes on top where it almost redacts or cancels out the image underneath and creates this visual complexity that I'm looking for. And I like how it creates density and it um, collapses space. I think, again, that this is a way to get to um, a maximal place where I want to overload the optic nerve and have um, a hyper-stimulated visual experience for the viewer and for me as the creator. And in a way, I'm trying to find forms and images that create um, a hyper-stimulated visual experience, kind of like a, a visual equivalent of spiritual ecstasy, like something where your optic nerve is vibrating and super activated. Years ago, I was remodeling a house and my brother was helping me and he's a mathematical mind. He's really theoretical and we had a really complicated floor we were putting in. Nothing is square in an old house and we were doing some soldier joints and some angles that were super complicated. And he grew really excited and said, oh, I'm gonna um, do some mathematical proofs or geometric proofs and figure out what these angles are supposed to be. So I was listening to him for a while and trying to follow along and Finally, I said, yeah, do that. And I'm curious to see what you find. And I just grabbed two pieces of wood and I cut them and I put them together and it didn't work. And I cut it again and then adjusted it, cut it again. And then eventually it worked. And I finished um, this corner we were working on right as he came over with the proofs that showed that I should use the angles that I kind of came to physically. And so I don't know that there's one way that is better or right or wrong, but there is for me. And this kind of, Figuring things out through a physical process is core to who I am. I think that being an artist is about finding your center and what is intrinsically rewarding to you. There are a lot of extrinsic forces, whether it be um, style or the art world or praise or hate. And I think that it feels important to me to find a center of who I am and what I could do for 10 years without praise. And I think making is part of that. I also take care of orchards or have for years had orchards. And I was thinking about apple trees. You know, you have to take care of the apple trees, but what apple trees do when they're in the right environment is they produce apples. It doesn't matter to an apple tree if they fall to the ground or if they rot or if birds eat them or if people eat them or if nothing happens to them. Apple trees just make apples. And I realized that I make things and objects like apple trees make apples. This is just core to who I am.